you've spent decades studying murderers, liars, world leaders, becoming an expert at decoding this hidden language. What do we need to know, like in our everyday lives? What are the basics that you want everybody to be equipped with so that we can spot when people are lying, so that we can spot these signals that somebody is giving to us and be more empowered in life? Where do we even begin, Janine? Uh, it's a great question, Mel. I, first, I would start with us before decoding others, right? Okay. So emotional intelligence is self-awareness, social awareness, self-adaptation, motivating others to be the best version of themselves. So let's start with self-awareness. Okay? okay. When it comes to ourselves, what is a lot's happening? I call it a behavioral fingerprint. What's your behavioral fingerprint? You know, what's your movement DNA look I like? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're so dynamite. Are you kidding? You you, and you 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 listen. You're like making a bagel in your kitchen or whatever, like, and then you say some sound bite, and it goes. You know, millions of people are watching it, and lives are being changed because of it. Your body language is great. You're very authentic, and here's why: if we can, I love trees, and if you at home can imagine a tree, there's the four stages of how we communicate. And if you think of a tree, Mel, and you at home is that we're going to start with the roots of the tree. The roots of the tree is what we believe. I spoke at uh, Georgetown University and someone said, a woman, at the end of my presentation, yeah, excuse me, I have a group interview tomorrow, five people are interviewing me. Janine, is there a question you would ask at the end of the interview? And I said, yes, I would ask to each of them, what do you consider the ideal candidate to look like and how do I measure up to your expectation of the ideal candidate? Oh. And the woman, had you all been there, you would have seen her and heard her say, oh, I could never ask that, I would look desperate. And you would have heard me respond, you're right. You would look desperate. I would look confident. Is that because of the roots? It's because of the roots of the tree. It's what I believe, because I really mm. want to know that question. A lot of us, for the women who are listening, a lot of us women, we really do ourselves a huge disservice. Men go in and men say, uh, excuse me, Mel, I just found out my mother's coming to town 4th of July. I'm taking four days off. Confident, solid body language. Women, we ask the same question that same day. We will often, many of us, come in shoulder shrugging. And we put our shoulders up to our ears. Hey, boss, I just found out, shoulder shrug, that my mother's coming to town, shoulder shrug. I didn't know she was coming. Could I take the 4th of July off? And your boss says, yes to Bob and no to Jane. Jane, ask me again in June. And we walk away and say, this is, this is what happens. See, it's a double standard. Now, I'm not saying there's not a double standard with men and women, because there is. But there are some areas where we have to take responsibility for the results we're getting. And here's the right reason. When we shoulder shrug, we're going to talk about this hopefully in a bit, but a shoulder shrug means uncertainty, and it's also connected to deception, which we'll talk about hopefully in a, in a minute. But a shoulder shrug means uncertainty. And we have mirror neurons. You yawn, Mal, or Donna, or Jesse, or Amy, or Andrea, whoever's listening. You yawn, I yawn. Science, Mel, I know you love science. I know you love what's happening in the brain and how the brain and the body are talking to one, or one another because they are. So when I come in uncertain, how am I making my boss feel, Mel? Uncertain. And uncertain. they probably don't even realize it. Like like you, I, I've, I've been watching a bunch of your TED Talks and you did this exercise with the audience and we can do it with everybody listening where simply take a second and say the words, can I have the 4th of July off while your shoulders are hiked up towards your ears? And you'll realize your entire body and energy is questioning the words that are coming out of your mouth. It's impossible, Janine. You're absolutely right. I've never even thought about it. Impossible to even feel confident if you're talking with your shoulders up at your right. ears. You're shrugging right. them up. Well, and you're planting pumpkin seeds and expecting tomatoes to grow. <laughs> It's true. I mean, it, it begins on. with like, the roots. And it's though. not our fault. It's not your fault because no one is teaching us this. Okay. We just want to be liked. We don't want to be inconveniencing people. We don't know if we're bothering. But if you look at the, the many of the men are inconfident alpha women, they just come in unapologetically. That's the roots of the tree. What is it that you're planting? Because what you're planting is going to grow whatever the seed is connected to. So get to those roots of the tree. It's what do you believe? What's the, the second part? The, the trunk. What, okay, what's yeah, the, the second part? the trunk part? of the tree is body language. And now this is interesting because after body language comes the branches. The branches, Mel, and you at home, are the branches are thought. So this means body language comes 
before thought. And here's the deal. It comes up to five seconds before thought. Do, Mel, do you think five seconds is a, is a good advantage for the military? Would five seconds matter? It's life or death, I would think. Do you think five seconds ha matter with an athlete? It's winning or losing. Can five seconds with you, with your 10 second rule, can five seconds make a difference? Of course. Can I jump out of bed? Yes. At five seconds? Yes. With understanding what I'm talking about now, first is the intention, the roots of the tree, then body, uh, then body language, and then thought. This means you get a five second advantage to know how someone else feels before their brain knows how they feel. This is why when I say, hey, Mel, I can't come and join you for Thanksgiving this year. And you go, not a problem, Janine, and your lips disappear. Everyone pull your lips in and just say, not a problem. I not don't mind. Problem. And pull your lips in. Okay. Make them disappear. Make them disappear. And so I, Mel goes, not a problem, Janine. I say, when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. Mm -hmm. Or a lip roll is emotional control. What's a lip so, roll look like? That's this. Oh, lips so. Disappearing. Rolling those lips in. Okay. okay. So Mel says, not a problem. I now have a five second advantage. I know there is a problem because Mel's lips disappeared. And when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. So I know there is a problem. I know my dad's a hothead. When I see my dad's lips disappear, I've got five seconds to get my kids in the truck and get the heck out of Maine and my dad's cottage before my kids see the angry dad that I grew up with because they don't believe he exists, yeah. right? So I have a five second of day. Let's go, we gotta go, 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 you know, move on out. You know, it's like the Indy 500 fixing the tires really quick. So I might stick around and say, Mel, you know, maybe I'm wrong here, it seems that you're disappointed or there's, you know, there's something you're not saying. Five seconds later, I'm gonna tell you what that person's gonna say. Yeah, I am mad because last year you were supposed to come and you backed out three days before then. You have a five second head start if you can decode body language because the body language people are showing you, their brain doesn't realize how they feel just yet. Body language shows up before the branches, before that thought. And the last one are the leaves. The leaves of the tree, Mel, are the words. And words matter because words plant the next seed. Mm. The words matter. What falls off the tree is planting that next seed. I recently heard on TikTok, and by the way, my friend said, you don't say you saw it on TikTok. You say you read it in the New York Times recently. So <laughs> I told my sons, my three sons, I go, I recently read in the New York Times and Jackie, he's my wise guy, the little one. He, he goes, yeah, I heard Terry Moore tell you when you see something on TikTok to say you read it in the New York Times. So what you're about to tell us, did you really see it on TikTok, mom? I'm like, damn you, Jackie and your wiseness, you know? So here's what I heard on TikTok and maybe your listeners have heard it and maybe you've said it too. Did, have you heard, have you talked about the bees and the flies? No. So the bees are not flying around trying to convince the flies that honey tastes better than shit. <laughs> so I'm going to repeat that. The bees are not wasting time convincing flies that honey tastes better than shit. I want a tribe of bees. I still want to inspire and, 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 and influence the world, but only for the flies who are interested in tasting the honey. I recently broke up with a guy that I was dating named Jimmy. He's, a, he's amazing. I'm 5'9", I'm thick. He's 6'6". Six, six. He's an animal, right? He's like this giant. It's the first time I ever smelt, smelt, felt small. I finally started eating carbs again, dating Jimmy. I'm like, I can date carbs. I'm dating this giant. And I had to break up with him because of what my mother would call his stinking thinking. He is planting these seeds of negativity. He's like, people are going to take advantage of your weak. Your, they're going to mistake your kindness for weakness. He's planting the wrong seeds for me. I want a bee. I don't want a fly. So he's a fly. So someone said to me last night, so you've been single for two years and you're on these dating apps. What's going on? How come you're still single? I said, because I'm looking for bees. I'm looking for bees or flies that want to hang out with bees. That's what I'm looking for. So it goes back to the power of our words is creating what's coming next, right? It's, it's what are you planting? What are you planting? Get out of your stinking thinking. You have 17 seconds to stop complaining. And research says you have to, after 17 seconds, you have to bring your self-esteem back up. You have to say at least five positive things about yourself. 
And if you, after 17 seconds, if you add on a negative thing, another negative thing, you create momentum. And when you create momentum, then it's hard to stop the negativity. And you may talk about this, so excuse me if you do. No, I, I'm just fascinated listening to everything that you're saying. I want, though, to focus on how we can become better at spotting when somebody's lying to us, at spotting, because okay. I think that there's a lot of, you know, in the work that you and I do, you often find somebody after the heartbreak, after the cheating, after somebody has lied to you. And what I would love for you to help us understand is how can we get better at spotting the signs that based on decades of research, based on your expertise, the signs aren't lying. Like we can lie to ourselves and we can make excuses for the way people are treating us and we do all the time. And you always say, stop listening to what people are saying and start looking at how they're treating you because that's the truth about how they feel about you. But the signs don't lie. And half right. the time people shrugging their shoulders or folding in their lips or kind of sending these body language signals, they don't even realize they're doing it because the signs don't lie. And so yes. what are the big ones that we right. have so to be aware one. of? Yeah. So, so if I can just put a cap on that last part yep. of understanding yourself, there are body language moves you can do to be seen as confident and powerful. One is I'm doing it now. If you're seeing me, it's called steepling. And you'd see Mr. Burns do this. It's fingertips to fingertips, making like a church steeple. When we steeple people, we intimidate people. The higher the steeple, the more intimidation. So it's a sign of confidence. So a nice low steeple, especially if you're a woman in a meeting and men are like, over talking you instead of saying let me finish with a palm down gesture like you're the police on a raid and telling people to get on the ground if you just lean back and steeple uh, someone else at the table will quiet down the people who are interrupting you so that when we steeple people we intimidate people it's a sign of confidence Another let me ask you a question about that yeah. so <clears throat> just so everybody listening gets this because i think this is critical you're in a meeting at work or you're at a family dinner <clears throat> or you're out with a bunch of girlfriends or whatever, and people are talking over you, you're saying that instead of raising your hand or stop talking over me or continuing to talk, if you lean back, you put your fingertips together and make kind of like a church steeple or a triangle, and you lean back in your chair, and mm -hmm. then you stare at the person who is talking over you, or what do you do? Well, you can do, you could either stop looking at them or look at their forehead, and you would think that they don't feel it, but when someone's being disrespectful, if you look at their forehead, it can change it. Um, I don't wanna get into some advanced stuff, but I'll tell you this. When we talk to people, I talk out of my right eye into your left eye, because you're opposite me, right? So our, I'm talking primarily out of my right eye. All human beings, doesn't matter if you're righty or lefty. We talk out of our right eye into your left eye. If I want to intimidate you, because I don't like your behavior, or the inappropriate things you're saying. My right eye will go diagonal to your right eye. And when I, I you can do this to a waitress and, and they come to take your order and you just focus your right eye to their right eye. So you're gonna go diagonal and they'll, they'll start to pacify. You'll see them fix their hair, touch their throat because it's this little hidden power that we have. So you can look at someone's forehead. You can look out of your predominant right eye here as you're talking to someone's left eye, diagonal crossing and then that steeple, or just stop looking at them all together and stop giving them your attention. And the steepling, someone else at the table, whether it's professional or personal, will say, hey, Mike, hey, Jeff, hey, Susan, stop interrupting her, let her finish. You know, I like to say, do you wanna be right or do you wanna be effective? In the well, old effective. days, I would be like mouthy, you know, and I'd be like, you know, attitude-y. But I would always leave. I was always the bad guy walking out of the meeting. And I got sick of being the bad guy. And I'm like, okay, I need to be more effective here. My mother taught me steepling. She was a nurse. She's since passed. And, and I had a boss that used to point and she'd be like, Richard, my office now, Marjorie, should walk into this pool of people at desks. And they became cartoon figures. Their eyes popped out of their head and they looked full of fear. And I called my mother. I was 25. I was in the World Trade Center in New York. And I go, mom, my boss does this aggressive thing. If she does it to me, I'm mouthy. You know, I'm going to lose my cool job with ATF. My mother was a nurse for elderly homeless people, Mel in Boston, Committee to Eld End Elderly Homelessness, and at Mount Auburn Hospital in Cambridge. I went home, five foot two, I'm five nine, she's a peanut. 
she goes, I want you to do this. This is before I knew it was called steepling and fingertips to fingertips. And I go, what's that called? She goes, I have no idea. I just know when a doctor says my mom was Lorraine, Lorraine, can I talk to you about the last patient? She goes, I always feel like I'm in trouble. So lo and behold, Colleen, my boss at the World Trade Center, did it to me two months later. Janine, my office, she pointed at me, was aggressive. I pulled out mom's move, which I now know is called steepling. Oprah Winfrey does it all the time. I walked casually behind Colleen with my steeple. When I went into her office, had you been there, you would have heard her say, do you know why I called you in my office? And with my steeple in hand, I responded the way mom told me. I said, I have a pretty good idea, Colleen. She was why I go, I'm exceeding all your expectations. <laughs> As you might imagine, she's like, what? I'll do that at the end of the year in an evaluation. I got to spread it out. I love attention from my boss, still steepling. Every now and then call me in and I'll come skipping in. I come in early. I stay late. I know I'm exceeding your expectations. Isn't that why you call me in? She didn't know what to do. I worked for her for three and a half years. She never called me in her office again. The reason she had called me in that day was to bully me. And when I said, why did you call me in? She said, oh, I just want to see how you're enjoying living in New York City. She was a bully boss. So if you have bully bosses and bully people in your life, pull out that steeple because when you steeple people, you have power over people. Does it work with a spouse or somebody you're dating? It does, and kids. Yeah, they, they feel like they're in trouble. Yeah, so if you want to make them feel like they're in trouble and that you're not going to be pushed around easily, 100% steeple. Steeple. I love it. It's almost like a little shield that you're creating. It's like you can become your own superhero superpower when you steeple. It's like Wonder Twins Unite and they used to hit yeah. their fists. Like you're now yeah. creating a force field. You you are in charge when you put the steeple up. I absolutely love that. I love Thank the steeple. You. you know, I don't do you know Desiree Gruber? Have you ever met her? No. So she's in New York City. Um, she came up with the idea marketing company of the uh, Victoria's Secret fashion show back in the day. And by the way, Victoria's Secret initially didn't want it. And then when they had it, it blew out the internet. It was the first time the internet crashed was the Victoria's Secret fashion show. And Victoria's Secret wasn't happy at first. And then the publicity exploded. Victoria's Secret fashion show with the wings and the lingerie. Well, she once sent me a picture. She's a client. And she sent me a picture of her steepling in the Oval Office in the White House because she said she was nervous with all those heavy hitters. So she brought her steeple out in the Oval Office. Nancy Pelosi, all these people were there. That's and pretty so cool. When you're nervous, steeple, you can fake it there. So and the other move I wanted to say is a chin grab. Uh, Indra Nui is the former CEO of PepsiCo. I love Indra Nui. Google her if everyone doesn't know who she is. Um, Indian. She was raised in India. She has a sister. Her mother used to every night at the dinner table have her and her sister debate. You're running for president of the United States. You're running for prime minister of Australia. And they would debate. She grows up, becomes a female CEO of PepsiCo. Wow. When Maybe that's what I did wrong. I've just been going, get your elbows off the table. <laughs> to your kids. So when she does an interview, look at Indra Nui, she grabs her chin and I say, when we grab our chin, we're about to win. Take a picture of yourself. How do you normally sit? And now uh, take a picture of yourself for holding your chin. Look how much more intelligent we look. We look like we have a master's degree. We look like we have it all figured I out. I literally look like I just won the Pulitzer Prize. And yeah, see here I figured them. I was joining, I was holding my chin because it's very pointy. I don't really like it. So I'm kind of hiding it, but it, uh, it does look very Well, can I tell you what your pointy astute. chin means? Yeah, what is my it's pointy like chin? Like a shovel and a pointy <laughs> chin, you can take it. You can take something on the chin, and a pointy chin is like a shovel, and that you will fight for people. You will fight. You will have that determination. Is that 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 chin right there? And so wow. So can you what? I I have to I have to just tell you a quick story. Yeah. When my husband was in the restaurant business, we couldn't go out to another restaurant and actually have a nice date. Because the man would be so preoccupied. Oh, there's 40 seats. There's this many waiters. Like he was just in the 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 language of running a restaurant. So he wasn't I can reverse engineer what he does with his body language based on you telling me that. Would you want me to tell you what he does with his body language? Yeah. But what I was going to say is, can you actually be with other people and not be decoding them? <laughs> like that, that uh, movie where Jim Carrey becomes God. All right. And he turns it into sticky notes. And then he turns it into an email system. Um, some things I can't unsee, but I have ADD, so sometimes I'm daydreaming and not paying attention. So if you prime me in advance to decode whoever you're with, um, then I'll see it all. Otherwise, I'm kind of not really paying. I can't unsee what we're about to talk about, detecting deception. I can't unsee the detecting deception hotspots I'm going to share with you. Okay. I can't unnotice them. So we'll go over those in a second. But I will, I'm going to reverse engineer what your husband does, and I've never met him. I don't know him. 
I know about, you know, one business was doing well, you opened up another one and didn't do so well and another one didn't so yes. and then I know your story about the, the, the this rocket ship. So I wanted you to do a test and you at home, anyone who pays attention to all the details like Mel's husband, right? All these little teeny details. I want you to watch how they drink their water tonight at dinner or tomorrow at breakfast or today at lunch, whatever time you're listening to this amazing Mel Robbins podcast. And I, I'm going to tell you what they're going to do with their water, these detail oriented people. And by the way, I am not one of them, is when they drink their water, Mel, I want you to notice this with your husband. What's his first name? Chris. Chris. All right. He's going to drink his water. When he puts the glass or the bottle on the table, he's going to watch it until it hits the table. When he goes to pick up the bottle, he's going to look at the bottle, keep looking at it as he grasps the bottle. He's going to keep looking at it, grasp the bottle. People like me who are not detail oriented, what I do is I see, I see the table. I look down where the table is. I grab my bottle of water, but I'm still looking at you. So I look just to see, oh yeah, my water's still there. I look at the water and then I look back at you and I pick it up without looking at the water. And now I'm looking at you and I put it down without looking at the table. I figure gravity and the thing I just picked it up from are still there. Detail-oriented people, they have a magnifying glass. It's like Inspector Crusoe or Sherlock Holmes. And so when they talk to you, Jimmy Fallon, Amy Schumer, Jennifer Lawrence, their, their humor, all three of those people, are about the details. They remember words from movies and words from songs. Watch them in interviews, right? They will talk. They're like smart bombs. So it's not just the water. It's all their energy is directed in one area. So Jimmy Fallon will talk, and his hand points up, and his eyes point up. You see Jennifer Lawrence. Hi, nice to meet you, with a handshake in her head. They're almost, I feel like I can't get away from their energy. If you're talking to me and all of a sudden, if Chris, your husband was doing this, I'd be like, whoa, detail oriented, aren't you? You like to research the research and then recommend more research and watch how they put the drinks down. Um, I'm speaking today at a company called Paylocity and two of their big executives. I watched them last night at their little cocktail hour and I secretly videotaped them. Oh, my God. Are you going to play it during your keynote? Oh, yeah. I went up and asked for permission today. But <laughs> as they drank their water, they watched it till it hit the table as if like, hi, I'll be right back. You made it. And I said, are you detail oriented? Do you love to research the research to executives? They go, yes. How do you know that? I go simply by how I watched you drink your water. I said, if I put a coaster on the table would, and it was crooked, would you adjust the coaster? Both said 100%. So in meetings, if you're listening and you're a business person, especially sales, make sure you have coasters crooked on the table. Now, some people who aren't detail oriented may just fix it because it's irritating, but watch if they watch their glass when they put it down all the way till it hits the table. Someone like me, I, when it hits the table, my eyes are back on you. It's not even looking at where it's What going. does that tell you about how to sell to them? It says you, they want lots of detail, two things. One, they're going to want lots and lots of details. That's number one. Number two, in your emails, if you're detail oriented, in your emails are probably too long. And someone like me, I'm never going to read your emails. I'm going to pick up the phone and call and say, okay, what do I need to know about this event? What's the dress code? Where is it? What you need to do if you're detail oriented in your emails or text messages at the top, think like Twitter. Here's the, what you must know. Mm. Here's the three things you must know. Additional information is below. Someone like me who's not motivated by details, I don't look at the water when I put it down or pick it up. I need to do the opposite. Here's what you need to know. Boom, boom, boom. Here's a link to additional information if you'd like to explore on your own. Fun things to do while you're in Orlando. Here's a link. Hotels you can stay in Orlando. Here's the link. Broadway you know, shows you can see in New York. So if you understand people's behavioral fingerprints, and there's a bunch of things, maybe I'll come back and play again and answer questions. You can sell to them differently. You can raise the kids differently. You can understand them. There's 7 billion people, 7 or 8 billion in the, in the world. Eight, 26 billion different behavioral fingerprints. Oh, my God. Now I'm overwhelmed. You know which ones I want to focus on? Yeah. Deception. Deception. Here we go. Shoulder shrug. A shoulder shrug we talked about earlier is uncertainty. When I say, hey, Mel, uh, what do you want for lunch? A salad, a BLT? I don't know. What do you want? A shoulder shrug makes sense there. Your verbal says, I don't know. And your nonverbal says, I don't know. It's congruent. But when I say, hey, Mel, um, your favorite TED talk of mine is blank. And I shoulder shrug. It does not mean I don't like that talk. 
but it does indicate there's something I'm uncertain about. Ask me if I ever cheated on my husband when I was married to him. Did you ever cheat on your husband when you're married to him? No. <laughs> now, I said no, and for people who are listening, I shrugged at the same time, and that's why Mel's laughing. But it doesn't mean I cheated. See, that shrug means, Mel, you opened a file in a cabinet that says top secret of something I don't want to share with you. Oh. And maybe what I don't want to share is that he cheated on me, and I'm called the human lie detector. Hypothetically, he cheated on me. Hypothetically, he went on Tinder two days before Christmas, and my friend told me because he showed up in her account hypothetically so uh, the shoulder shrug doesn't mean i'm canceling what i'm saying but it does mean there's something i'm uncertain about and and i may not even realize it yet why because you have a five second advantage over my brain i don't even realize i'm uncertain about something right now but if you can spot it you can simply say i call it miw formula maybe i'm wrong you know maybe i'm wrong here mel but it seems to me or it feels to me that you're uncertain about something and then let the person say, well, yeah, I just was in the bathroom and I overheard a woman saying her significant other stepping out on her. And she's devastated. And it's not my story to tell. But when you asked if I cheated on my husband, you kind of open a file to just cheating in general. So that's why I was uncertain. I am really excited to introduce you to a woman that I met over a decade ago. She has spent over two decades decoding body language, trained by the FBI and the CIA. She has studied the biggest murderers on the planet in history. This is also an episode about empowerment. There are simple things that you can learn to do to gain more influence, to be more persuasive, and to exude confidence. 